Good morning. My name is Douglas Griffin. This is my Sunday school class. Um, we are in the book of Exodus, we're starting the fourth chapter of Exodus. Everybody knows the story of Exodus, but we're kind of examining how the Bible tells the story instead of what we're used to seeing in movies. It's kind of important what God wrote down as opposed to how we've heard it. Uh, other places. So we're just going verse by verse because it's re really important lessons here. Um, where we last left, I, I keep describing Moses' uh, background because that informs how he reacts to God. He went through some trauma as a child. He went through some trauma as a young adult. And that affects his relationship with God like it does with all of us. Because <sighs> we tend to project onto God things that we've learned from the adults that were in our lives, um, we think, or our lessons we took. It doesn't even mean that the adults taught us these things. It's lessons that we took uh, from the different experiences. And then we think, oh, God's kind of the same way. God's silent, or God's mean, or God's forceful, or God doesn't really care. Or All these things we project onto God, and, and Moses certainly did uh, because of his experiences. So. We know that he was put in a basket as a child, but he was raised by his mother for two years. He was adopted by the Pharaoh's daughter. The Jews, the Israelites were in Egypt, but he was raised as an Egyptian for 40 years. When, at the age of 40, he tried to relate to his people, they weren't having it because you're an Egyptian. You talk like an Egyptian, uh, you look like one, you act like one. We can't relate to you. And this hurt Moses' feelings. And he spends the next 40 years in the desert, in Midian, having run away. Uh, and then God shows up. Again, I reminded us that the problem with Moses is that he did have an instinct that he was supposed to deliver his people. He thought to himself, there's got to be a reason why I was spared uh, the death that happened to so many of my peers as babies. There's got to be a reason. But he didn't wait to ask God, how do you want this done? And sometimes we're clear what God wants done. We don't ask God how. We just make up our minds and we do it that way. And then we're mad when it doesn't work. But if you're doing things God way, God's way, of course it works. You know, doesn't mean there's no opposition, but it works. So he let it go. He says, well, I didn't work. This is when God meets him in the desert sets a bush on fire that doesn't burn because God's trying to teach him I'm eternal. See how I don't change. See how this bush is burning, but nothing's happening. It's not actually like nothing's happening. There's fire here, but nothing's being destroyed. It's just this eternal flame that could just go on forever, couldn't it? That's who I am. And, and that's kind of what we're getting at today is God is having to teach the people, reteach them who he is. And everything he does, everything God does, is a reteaching. It's not. Um, it's not. Let me just randomly pick these things to do because they're showy. I'm trying to teach them who I am. So you'll see what I mean. So at the end of chapter three, at the end of Exodus chapter three, uh, verse eighteen, it says, "If you go down and do what I say." says, then they will heed your voice and you shall come. You and the elders of Israel, both, will come to the king of Egypt and you shall say to him, the Lord God of the Hebrews has met with us. And now please let us go three days journey into the wilderness that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God. So that's what God is asking Pharaoh to do uh, because he's allowed people to do that before. And it's kind of to show Pharaoh, see, I'm asking you to do something that you've allowed other cultures to do. And again, we have historical proof that Western Semites lived in Egypt and were allowed to go three days journey. I mean, allowed to go into the wilderness and then come back and sacrifice. Again, they don't uh, have sacrifices of animals in Egypt because they worship their animals. They consider them gods uh, like at, least at, that, at this time in, 
in 1700 BC. Um, similar to like in, in India, the cow is sacred, etc. So if you were to sit and slaughter a cow, people would be very upset. So we want to sacrifice sheep and goats and all these things like God wants us to do. Let's go into the wilderness and do it and then we'll come back. Pharaoh, of course, is going to say no. And this is God saying, see, I asked you a reasonable thing and said no, so now I'm going to have to ask you a bigger thing. You're still going to say no, but I want it to be on record that you said no to the reasonable thing because you're just saying no. It's not because I'm asking something unreasonable. It's about you. And God sometimes puts us through things and say, see, this is about you. This is not about that person because what that person said was not that bad, but you got all upset. So that's you. Something's going on with you. All right. So let's go three days early into the wilderness that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God. And then we're going to come back. But God says, I'm sure that the king of Egypt will not let you go. I already know what's going to happen. Not even by mighty hand, not even when I pressure him. So I will stretch up my hand and strike Egypt with all my wonders, which I will do in the midst. And after that, he will let you go. But I won't have changed his will. It still won't be his will to let you go, but he'll be forced to do it. Uh, but Pharaoh still will be upset, and he'll still try to stop you, and that will be his downfall. So uh, uh, in Exodus chapter 3, verse 21, it says, And I will give this people favor in the sight of the Egyptians, and it shall be when you go that you shall not go empty-handed. It explains also, when you leave, don't worry. Well, we've got nothing. We're just going to the desert with nothing. That's crazy. He said, no, you won't go empty-handed. You'll be blessed when you go. Now, Exodus chapter 4, verse 1. So Moses is given his objections. His objections, his first objection was, who am I that you would send me? I'm nobody. And God says, right, I'll be with you. And that's the key, because a lot of times God asks us to do something. Well, who am I? I'm, <laughs> I'm no one. Uh, you don't have to be anyone. I'm going to be there. I'm going to do it. You just have to go and open your mouth. I'll do the rest. So here's Moses' second objection. Moses, uh, Exodus chapter 4, verse 1. Then Moses answered and said, but suppose they will not believe me or listen to my voice. Suppose they say, the Lord has not appeared to you. So he's talking, and he's talking about the people. Okay, first I get, you can be with me, but what if they don't believe me? God, you know, these people, they don't like me. And this is all based on his earlier trauma. Last time I went and said, hey, they they said, who do you think you are? So this is legitimate in Moses' eyes. So the Lord said to him, what is that in your hand? Now, God's not asking this because he doesn't know. God didn't go, wait a minute, what is that in your hand? He's saying, what is it that you already have with you? Because you, you, there's something that you already have with you. He says, a rod. Now, Moses has had this rod his whole life. Uh, Egyptians used it as a walking stick. Cool, they'd have this walking stick. They'd walk around with it. When they were older, you would lean on it like a cane. Shepherds used a rod, a staff, to uh, shoe the sheep, you know, and get them to do what they want, to, what he wants them to do, right? The word here, rod, is not the word for staff. Uh, even though Moses was a shepherd, he'd been using this rod probably to do both things. He might have had a staff and a rod. But uh, he's using this rod, and he's he traveled the desert with it. God's saying, look what you already have with you. And this is very important because we, a lot of times we, if only God would send some brand new thing, then I could do what he wants me to do. And God says, no, I, I'm going to use what you already have. You don't, it doesn't have to be some incredible thing. There's something already with you. I'm going to use your voice or your clothes or your house. or You don't have to wait for some new thing. What's that in your hand? Oh, it's a rod. Um. Let's give me, a, a, here's an example of that. In 2 Kings chapter 4, verse 1, it says, A certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophets cried out to Elijah. So she was the wife of a son of a prophet. She cried out to Elijah saying, Your servant, my husband, is dead. So her, the son of the prophet had died. And you know that your servant feared the Lord. 
and the creditor is coming to take my two sons to be his slaves. So Elisha said to her, well, what shall I do for you? Tell me, what do you have in your house? And she said, uh, your maid servant has nothing in the house but just a jar of oil. And then we know that Elisha did a miracle with the jar of oil, right? God supplied, Elisha did the music, miracle, God did the miracle. But Elisha said, okay, here, just take what you already have in your house. Uh, and that's significant, again, because sometimes we are just waiting. Like, take that $5 you have in your wallet and watch me use it. Take that book on your shelf, whatever. Uh, God's like, the answer's already there. I just need you to trust me. You already have something with you where I can use. So what's that? That, that rod Moses in your hand? So then he says to him, cast it on the ground. So he cast it on the ground and it became a serpent. A real serpent, because it says Moses fled from it. So it turned, I don't turn into a cobra, I don't know, whatever frightening. It was so that he, it wasn't like, oh, look at those cute things. Like, ah! Uh, now, why a serpent? Why didn't God turn it into a, a dove or a leopard or something? Uh, why a serpent? Okay, so this thing that Moses has been leaning on his whole life, instead of leaning on God, I go, oh, I've got my rod with me, and this is going to see me through. I make sure I have my rod every day. God's like, you, your phone, you have your phone every day, but do you have me every day? There's, there's something that you have that has become more important than me that you lean on more than you lean on me. So throw it on the ground. Get it away from you. Let me show you what it really is. It's a serpent. Now, specifically a serpent, Moses got the message. Because again, God's teaching a lesson. Uh, this serpent came to Eve in the garden. Uh, Genesis chapter 3, verse 1 and 2. It says, now the, the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he says to the woman, has God indeed said that you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? God's already said, don't eat, you can eat of every tree except for that one. Did God really say that? And that's where the devil comes in. His, he, we give the devil way too much credit. The devil caused that storm, and the devil did. And the devil's not able to do all those things. But the devil comes to our minds and says, did God, you think God's really going to protect you? You think God's going to take care of that? You think God's really going to heal you? Do you think... But, you know, you uh, had a drink last night, so why would God help you out? Or, well, are you sure? Uh, that's the attack. And so it stops us from believing. It stops us from having faith. It's, he, he wants to stop us from moving forward with like, what God wants to do because he's casting down. He's doing that to Moses. They're not going to believe you, Moses. The devil's been in Moses' ear for 40 years saying, eh, see, those people don't really like you, Moses. Those people, those, those Israelites, they don't, they don't relate to you. You're not really one of them. Yeah, your mother was from Israel, but you were raised as an Egyptian. You went to help them, and now you're a Midianite, and you're you're shut. There's not. He's been in his. He's been carrying the devil around in his ear for forty years, so that when God actually shows up, instead of God shows up, and Moses doesn't go, okay, anything you say, he's actually arguing with God, because the devil in his ear has been stronger than the voice of God. Can you imagine God showing up in your house and saying, okay, I need you to go to the store, give me some ribs. You're like, uh, 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 hold up, Dad. Ribs? Did we not have ribs last night? You know, and he's like, what's wrong with you? Don't you know that I'm God? <laughs> no, I don't, because the devil's been in my ear, giving me all the reasons why I won't succeed, why it won't work, why I won't be healed, why I won't be delivered, why my rent money won't show up on time. And so he's saying, see that rod that you've been carrying around with you, you've been carrying the devil around with you the same way. Cast it from you. Let me show you what it really is. It's a serpent. It's a snake. And, and this is God's answer when, when he says, but what if they don't believe me? He, he, he says, get what, that thing that you've been carrying with you, get it out of your hand. Let me show you what it is. That's the devil talking to you. That's the serpent talking to you. So, then uh, Exodus chapter 4, verse 4, then the Lord says to Moses, now reach out your hand and take it by the tail. And he reached out his hand and he caught it and it became a rod again. Now, in, in James chapter 4, verse 7, it says, therefore submit to God, resist the devil and he'll free from you. He's like, you take hold of that thing. You, look what it is. 
And, and I will tell you that this rod began to be called the, the rod of God in, in the book of Exodus from then on. And he took the rod of God. It's like you need to let go of it and let go of all your insecurities and all your fears and understand that God's in control. Uh, 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 you know, don't let the devil <laughs> rule you. So, in Exodus chapter 4, verse 5, says, That they may believe that the Lord, the God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, has appeared to you. So, you need to show them this thing, too. Look, look, any sort of doubt they have, show them that that's the devil. It wasn't a parlor trick, like, ooh, they'll be so impressed. And that's kind of how we've been looking at it. Ooh, do this magic trick, and that'll get them. So he's actually saying, no, show them that if they doubt you, that it's the serpent that's making them doubt you. They'll remember that story. They know that the serpent came and spoke in Eve's mind and got her to disobey God, got Adam to disobey God, right? So I want them to, if they doubt you, he didn't say, hey, show up, and no matter what they say, do this. If they doubt you, show them what the doubt is. Show them the serpent and that that's what they are giving into, that it's just like the devil whispering in their ear, just like Eve did. Then they'll believe you. If they don't, if they don't, uh, Exodus chapter four, verse six, furthermore, the Lord said to him, now put your hand in your bosom, next to your heart, next to your chest, next to your heart, your hand that I'm asking you to use to do this and that, I want that to be my hand, but if there's more doubt, because you've doubted me twice, first you said, well, who am I? And now you're saying, but what if they don't believe me? And I'm telling you what to do, and you're arguing with me, and obviously I got to clearly retrain you uh, so that you understand I'm God. I'm, there's no other gods. I'm telling you what's going to happen. And so take your hand that is doubting me. Take your hand that I'm going to use, put it in your bosom. And when he took it out, it was leprous like snow, because he's saying, so, and leprosy was a type of, of sin. If, again, this is an answer to the doubt. If they still question you, then show them this sign. And it's, these are sin things that he's showing them. Again, it's not doing tricks, like, because he could have taken his hand and it was purple or something, or take out his hand and it had turned into a balloon. Uh, no, it's turning into leprosy because that's, that's an incurable disease. In Leviticus chapter 13, and this again, this is after, this is the law after, but leprosy was is catching and people who had, who had it had to be put out of the camp because there wasn't a cure for it. Um, in, Le in Leviticus chapter 13, verse 45 says, now the leper on whom the sore is, his clothes shall be torn, his head bare, Got to shave your head. He shall cover his mustache and cry, unclean, unclean. Anytime anybody comes near you, you got to warn people because you have this leprosy. And he shall be unclean. And all the days he has the sore, he shall be unclean. Because he is unclean. And he shall dwell alone. His dwelling shall be outside the camp. So I, if they doubt again, show them that this is leprosy. This is sin. This is something. This is a bad thing that you are doing. So I'm just emphasizing, we've always looked at this as these are parlor tricks that God is doing to impress people. Uh, oh, well, if they doubt, uh, you know, have a bouquet of roses appear. No, I, I'm going to show them a serpent. I want to show them leprosy, that that's what their doubt is. So that's why he's showing them these things. If they doubt, say, look, your doubt is like leprosy. Uh, and it was uncurable. They had not seen it cured. In, in 2 Kings chapter 5, Verse 1, it says, Now Naaman was commander of the army of the king of Syria, and he was great and an honorable man in the eyes of his master, because by him the Lord had given victory to Syria. So Syria had defeated another nation, and Naaman was the captain who had was over the army at the time. And, and the scripture says Syria, who's not Israel, had been given victory by the Lord uh, through Naaman, so he was also, though, he was also a mighty man of valor, but a leper. So now he's got to be separate. Some, at some point on one of the journeys, and when he had contracted leprosy. So the king wants him cured because Naaman cannot be around other people. He's been this great hero, but now that he contracted leprosy, ah, he can't, I can't use him anymore. 
So he sends a letter to the king in Israel because they'd heard that there was a miracle worker there who could cure leprosy because no one had ever seen leprosy cured. In verse uh, 7, it says, And it happened when the king of Israel read the letter that he tore his clothes and said, Am I God to kill and make alive that this man sends a man to me to heal him of his leprosy? Therefore, please consider and see how he asks a quarrel with me. Like he, he's just seeking a quarrel, with, like he must seek a fight because he, I, no, we've never seen leprosy cured. So leprosy was representing the sin that separates us from God, right? You've got to be outside the camp, outside the camp in order for it to be cured. There's something else that happened outside the camp. I just want to point out um, in Hebrews 13, 11, it says, for the bodies of those animals whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin, they're burned outside the camp. Now, these were specific animals. This was the red heifer, which we don't hear a lot about. It was very rare if you had a red heifer, but if you did, it was supposed to be burned and killed outside the camp. And the reason is uh, because the, the priests were supposed to purify the temple, but who was going to purify the priests? Uh, the priests were holy enough to purify the people and the, and the, you know, but something bigger than the priests had to purify them uh, because the priests, if someone died, they had to, they would bury the, and then now they've come in contact with death. And since God just had to make a general rule, like just don't touch dead people because you don't know what they died of and you didn't, you don't have a Lysol to wash your hands with. Uh, so if you come in contact with a dead body, you need to stay away from people because that that contagion may still be on them and you may pass it on. So uh, so someone had to purify the priests because they had touched dead bodies. Uh, in Numbers chapter 19, verse 1 through 5, it says, Now the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, saying, This is the ordinance of the law which the Lord has commanded, saying, Speak to the children of Israel that they bring you a red heifer without blemish in which there is no defect and on which a yoke has never come, right? So nobody's ridden it, nobody's used it, it's spotless. And you shall give it to Eleazar the priest that he may take it outside the camp where the lepers were, where the things happened outside the camp. And it shall be slaughtered before him. And Eleazar the prince shall take some of its blood with his fingers and he sprinkles some of the blood seven times directly in front of the tabernacle of meeting. So you're now you're trying to purify the tabernacle. Then the heifer shall be burned in his sight, its hide, its flesh, its blood, and its awful shall be burned. So you're going to burn it, and they're going to take the ashes, and they're going to put the ashes in water. Uh, verse 9, then a man who was clean shall gather up the ashes of the heifer and store them outside the camp in a clean place, and they shall be kept for the congregation of the children of Israel for the water of purification. It is for purifying from sin. So this is the only thing that can purify the priest who's touched the dead bodies, purify the temple, so that then the priest can then purify the people. This red heifer has to be burned outside the camp, and its ashes will purify. Okay, verse uh, 13. And whoever touches the body of anyone who has died and does not purify himself defies the tabernacle of the Lord. That person shall be cut off from Israel. He shall be unclean because the water purification was not sprinkled on him. His uncleanness is still on him. So that death is still on you. That death is still on you. So you got to stay out of the cap and be purified because death is on you. So leprosy represented death. These red heifers, if you touch dead body, that was the only thing that could purify you, right? So, uh, and I'll get back to that. So he's showing you, if they doubt you, show them that it's a snake. If they doubt you a second time, show them that it's leprosy. That's what they're doing. Again, the sign is not to impress them. The sign is to teach them. Exodus chapter 4, verse 7. And he said, now put your hand in your bosom again. So he put his hand in the bosom again, and he drew it out of his bosom. Behold, it was restored like his other flesh. So now it's, it's clean again, right? So there is healing for the leprosy. There is a redemption for it. But show them that their doubt is like leprosy. It's like a serpent. In Hebrews chapter 13, verse 11 and 12, it says, For the bodies of those animals, just reminding you, whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin are burned outside the camp. Remember, that's the red heifer that's burned outside the camp because the priest has touched death. And the only thing, there was only the red heifer could purify the death, right? He says, Therefore, Jesus, 
just like that red heifer was burned outside the camp. Therefore, Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, he suffered outside the gate. Outside. So, and, and the, it was Mount Moriah, which was outside the gate, it was facing the east gate. So Mount Moriah is facing the east gate. And that's where Jesus was crucified. That was, that's where the Garden of Gethsemane was. That was the Mount of Olives, Mount Moriah, that whole mountain area. That's where the red heifer was killed. That's where Jesus died outside the camp because he's representing our sin. He's taking on our sin, right? And, and so uh, that had to happen outside the camp because that whole thing was a lesson. <laughs> the only thing that's going to purify everybody is this red heifer that's burned outside the camp. Oh, look, Jesus died outside the camp. So you get the correlation. He's, God's trying to give visual aids to people so that they not only would see the words, but have a visual example of what needed to happen in order to cure their sin. Exodus chapter 4, verse 8. Then it will be if they do not believe you. So if they don't believe that, right? Nor heed the message of the first sign, that they will believe the message of the latter sign. So if they don't believe you, so actually there's three things. You said the Lord sent me. Then when they didn't believe you, you showed them it was a snake. Then if they don't believe you, you showed them it's leprosy. That your doubt, your disbelief is like a serpent. It's like leprosy that's covering you. So they don't believe any of that. It shall be if they do not believe even these two signs, what you said and the two signs, or listen to your voice, right, that you shall take water from the river and pour it on the dry land. And the water which you take from the river will become blood on dry land. So this is a third sign. Uh, the, the Nile River had become blood. When, well, in Exodus chapter 1, verse 22, it says, Pharaoh commanded all his people, saying, Every son who is born you shall cast into the river, and every daughter you shall save a lot. So every son at a certain point, that was Moses' age and down, was slaughtered and thrown into the river, and the river became blood. So that's this permanent death, right? He said, so if you tell them and they don't believe you, show them it's a serpent. If, you, if they doubt you again, show them that that's like leprosy. If you doubt you again, say, this is what you're doing. And, and I'm going to turn that water to blood just the same way Pharaoh did. It's going to be a permanent death. So that is what your unbelief is like. Uh, then Moses said to the Lord, oh, my Lord. So in Exodus chapter 4, verse 10, then Moses said to the Lord, oh, my Lord, uh, hold on. And this is uh, similar to uh, in Genesis chapter 18, verse 32, when Abraham's bargaining with God, not doubting God, but bargaining with God. And he says uh, in Genesis 18, 32, then he said, let not the Lord be angry. And I will speak but one more time. And it's a similar thing. Okay, okay, Lord, just I'm just going to say one more thing. Don't get mad. But suppose 10 should be found there. And he said, I will not destroy it for the sake of death. This is when God's saying to him, I'm going to go destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. And God's, and Moses, Amos, I'm like, no, no. What if I find 50 righteous people? I won't. If you find 50, it's pretty good. What if I find 40? He's bargaining him all the way down to 10. Okay, don't get mad. Don't get mad. I said, I have one more thing to say. What if there's 10? If there's 10, I won't do it. Now, God knew there weren't 10. God's like, oh, let's go down and see. I hope there's not 10. I, I already had my plans in motion. No, he knew there was not 10. And he came and told Abraham, let me show you what I'm going to do. Abraham's thinking he can change God's mind. God's saying, you don't even know. I've already done, I've already been an hour from now. I've already been four days from now. I'm telling you what's going to happen, but okay, for your sake. But you're not even going to find 10 righteous, which he didn't. He was able to take out Lot and his wife and his two daughters. Lot did not have two other daughters, uh, Jan, Skinner, Horton. He didn't have two other daughters. The scriptures make it, you could interpret it like, and he had two other daughters who stayed with their husbands, but it, he only had two daughters. And the two daughters went to their husbands and the husband says, no, we're staying. And so the two daughters left with Lot. So that's four people, four people. Uh, and that's all that he was. And that's all God had told him to bring out those four people, the rest I have to destroy. 
So Moses is saying, oh, my Lord, wait, wait, don't get mad, don't get mad. Just like Abraham is saying, don't get mad, don't get mad. He says, one more thing. I'm not eloquent. So I'm not saying I won't go. I'm saying I'm not eloquent neither before nor since you have spoken to your servant. I wasn't eloquent before you showed up. And since you started speaking to me, I can tell nothing has changed. I still cannot, I'm still not eloquent. So neither before or since you showed up and I'm still just as scared. I'm still worried about my speech. He says, but I'm slow of speech and I'm slow of tongue. Now, Jeremiah, I mentioned this last week, said a similar thing to God when God showed up. And, and again, we give God excuses for why we can't do what he wants us to do. Jeremiah, I'm not a preacher. I don't know the scriptures that well. Doug knows the scripture really well. Uh, so, but I don't know the scriptures like, he didn't ask, just go talk to your neighbor. I'll give you something to say. Just go talk to your son or, or the, per you don't have to have gone off the seminary for 15 years. We always give God an excuse why we can't talk to somebody. Uh, so Jeremiah, chapter one, verse six. Then, then I said, "Ah, oh, Lord God, hold up, Lord God." It was the same thing. Wait, hold on. Oh my Lord, oh Lord God, behold, I cannot speak for I'm a youth. So his excuse was, "I'm I'm young." And Jeremiah was young. He was in his twenties, early uh, mid twenties when God came to him. Uh, but the Lord said to me, "Do not say I'm young. I'm a youth." For you shall go to all whom I send you. So whoever I send you to, it'll be okay with them. I didn't. So whoever I send you to, it, your youth won't matter. And whatever I command you, you shall speak. So stop giving yourself excuses. So Moses, this is excuse number three. And this is like the blood one, right? The first excuse, okay, sir, but the second excuse, leprosy. Third time you say, no, it's blood. It's, so it says, and the Lord said to him, who has made man's mouth? Or, or, or who makes the mute, the deaf, the sing, or the blind? Again, not the devil. God makes all those decisions. Have not I the Lord? I'm the, I'm the, you're telling me <laughs> I can't speak. I made your mouth. And we give God, but Lord, I'm young. And so God's going to go, oh, I didn't realize you were young. Oh man, I know you were young. I was there when you were born. I created you. If I'm asking you to do something, I have already given you the equipment to do it. I've already given you the ability to do it. So, like, relax. I, I made your mouth. So you're trying to tell me about your mouth. I made it. Uh, now, therefore, go, and I will be with your mouth and teach you what you shall say. But he said, oh, my Lord, please send by the hand of whoever else you may send. So, please Please accomplish your mission by the hand of somebody, else, whoever else you're going to send. Uh, surely there's someone else you're going to send. So the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses because you're telling God he doesn't know what he's doing. He doesn't know who he's sending. He doesn't realize that you can't speak. He doesn't know that the people might reject him. Like God's not aware of any of these things. I've got to tell God. Poor God, he just showed up with a plan, but he had no idea about these things. So like God's like, okay, these people, look, in the 200 years they've been in Egypt, they thoroughly had. Abraham, when God showed up to Abraham and says, I want you to go, Abraham said, okay, and he just started walking. Even Isaac, Jacob, once God showed up to Jacob and showed, had his vision of the angels sending, he says, okay, now he still, he went, he still manipulated things this way because it took him a while to realize you don't have to manipulate things. We didn't fight with God. But these 200 years they've been in Egypt, which again is not God's design, they decided to stay in Egypt. They chose. Uh, so look what they have learned. They've learned to argue with God, that he's just another one of many gods in their mind and he doesn't realize all these things. And so... Moses is given excuse number five. <sighs> so the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses. And he said, is not your Aaron the Levite your brother? Uh, I know that he can speak well. And look, he's also coming out to meet you. Like he's already on his way to meet you. So I, I'm, I'm not asking. I'm telling you what to do. And then... All you have to do is be obedient to whoever I tell you to speak to. That's all. So I already know that your brother is coming. Now, 
how does God know? Well, of course, God knows over all, all things. But uh, here's why Aaron was on his way. And Aaron hadn't seen Moses in 40 years. So why is Aaron on his way to see Moses? Exodus chapter 2, verse 15, it says, When Pharaoh heard of this matter, when Pharaoh heard that Moses had killed someone, he sought to kill Moses. Moses fled from the face of Pharaoh. He dwelt in the land of Midian, right? So he left, and for 40 years he's gone. In Exodus chapter 4, verse 19, we're about to find out. Now the Lord said to Moses in Midian, go return to Egypt for all the men who sought your life are dead. So there's been a new regime. And whenever a new Pharaoh comes into office, he pardons. Again, we do it as a tradition. When, when a president is about to leave office, he pardons a bunch of people and then he leaves. In their culture, when you came in as a new Pharaoh in order to get everybody to love you and say, oh, look what a wonderful person you are, you pardon a bunch of people. So everybody who'd been convicted, who'd been guilty of a crime was now pardoned and you're all starting out equal to me. So, so everybody knew, oh, that Pharaoh's dead. The one who was gonna kill Moses, he's dead. So Moses has come back now. So when Aaron, his brother, saw that that Pharaoh was dead, he's like, I'm gonna go find my brother. Now Moses didn't know that that Pharaoh was dead, not until God tells him in a couple of verses. But Aaron knew, so he's saying, your, your brother Aaron's already on their way, because Moses said, who else are you going to send with me? There's surely somebody else that you're going to, hey, yes, yes, I'm trying to get you just to say yes and assume I am going to supply your need. And this is God's struggle with the children of Israel all the time in the wilderness. God, Lord, they'd wake up, hey, Lord, we're out of water. It's like, I, I know. I would love for you to one day just say, thank you, Lord, that you're going to supply my needs today instead of getting up and complaining before the day's even started. Trust me that I am going to take care of everything. So Moses is, our, but you are you going to send somebody with you? Yes, your brother's already on the way here. Again, he's on his way. Now, he doesn't know where Moses is. And you'll see later in verse 427, which says, the Lord says to Aaron, go into the wilderness to meet Moses. So He's saying he's already on his way, but at a certain point, he's going to meet Aaron and say he's in the wilderness because all that Aaron knew, he hadn't seen Moses. He just knew that he, had, well, he went up north, so he's going to start walking, looking for him. But he goes to uh, uh, Midian, dismiss. Okay, so he goes to Midian, and, and where do I find him? And God tells him where to find him. Okay. So, it says, when he sees you, he will be glad in his heart. Now, you shall speak to him and put the words in his mouth, and I will be with your mouth and with his mouth. So, tell him everything I said. I already, I already had this worked out. I want you to go to Pharaoh, and I'm giving you the message. I had it already worked out. You're going to tell it to Aaron. Aaron's going to tell it to Pharaoh. Aaron's going to And Aaron did a bunch of stuff that in the movies Aaron doesn't get credit for. It really was Aaron doing it, but God's still saying, but Aaron's not gonna know what to do. I'm gonna tell you, you have to pass it on. But I will always talk to you because you, you're the person I've chosen. And so even though you're gonna pass it on, don't let Aaron get beside himself, which he did a couple times. You're the one who I'm giving the message to and you'll pass it on to Aaron and he'll pass it on. So you shall put the words in his mouth and I will be with your mouth and with his mouth and I will teach you what you shall do. So he shall be your spokesman to the people and he himself shall be as a mouth for you and you shall be to him as God. It's just, just, just like I, he, he's saying you'll be as like I am to you, right? I'm telling you what to do. You'll pass it on to him. He'll have no clue. And that's kind of a thing. There are a lot of people who think they have a clue in certain situations, but God has already picked the person he's going to tell it to. And everybody else who thinks they know is incorrect. Exodus chapter 4, verse 30, here's an example. Aaron spoke all the words which the Lord had spoken to Moses, and then he did the signs in the sight of the people. Uh, Exodus chapter 7. And uh, you shall speak all that I command you, and Aaron, your brother, shall tell Pharaoh to send the children of Israel out of this land. So Aaron actually said the words. Uh, so Moses and Aaron went into Pharaoh, and they did so. This is Exodus chapter 7, just as Lord commanded. And Aaron cast down his rod before Pharaoh, before his service, and it became a serpent. So God's still speaking in Moses' ear, and nobody can hear what God is saying. And Moses is still saying the message, and Aaron is delivering it and passing it on. In verse 
last verse, verse 17, then I'm done. And you shall take this rod in your hand with which you shall do the sign. So this thing that you've already had with you all along, I don't have to give you some brand new thing. Uh, you've had this rod with you. You're going to take it with you and 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 use it. And so, because again, all of us who are waiting for God to give us some brand new, amazing things, some brand incredible, he's like, what do you already have in your house? What do you already have in your closet? What do you already have in your hand? What's already in your car? You already have all that you need. We just never believe that. We think we're waiting for God. To, oh, Lord, if you can just give me what I need. God's like, I've already given you what you need. You just need to look around and see that it's there for you. Okay, so we will go on from this uh, next week. Thank you so much again for tuning in. Uh, but it's interesting to examine what the scriptures actually say, uh, as opposed to the what the movies showed us. The movies were good, but they weren't totally accurate. And the more we can be accurate, uh, then we can know uh, what specifically God is wanting from us, how he's dealing with us. Uh, and I can't wait, uh, Jan Skinner, I can't wait to have a conversation with her uh, about what she found so interesting. Okay, and then on Wednesdays, uh, we are in the book of John. So if you have an opportunity to listen to that, Wednesdays and Sundays, we're, we're just going through the Bible, uh, and it's a very interesting journey. Okay, again, thank you so much for listening in, and I will see you either Wednesday or next Sunday. All right, bye-bye.